Welcome back to a record-breaking part four of I Catch Killers with our guest, Russell Oxford, retired Detective Chief Inspector. Okay, Russell, let's get into this. This is uh, now four hours. I'm going to wear you down. You're going to run out of stories if I keep firing them at you. <laughs> uh, bring it on. Bring it on. There's some darkness in your life. I'm going to find it, Russ. I'm determined. Um, okay. Uh, there's a couple of things that uh, I want to sort of draw your attention to and uh, and speak about. But uh, one matter that you um, uh, worked on, which was a particularly sad case, and it was the um, sexual assault of four Chinese students at uh, Waterloo. Um, can you tell us what happened there? Because I, I don't even know how to describe it because it's such a unique situation and uh, what happened with that particular uh, particular matter. Yeah, well, as I said, we're on call and we get called to a, the unit block at Waterloo and I think they're up on the sixth floor. And there were uh, three young girls and uh, one of the girls' boyfriend, and they were students, and they were uh, students of a of a local college around the, the area. And what had happened is um, the young girls were walking back into the unit, and they've buzzed their way in through the unit uh, with a swipe card. But this predator, this man, was uh, followed them in into the unit and followed them up to the hallway and burst into the room, and then for the next hour. Um, basically stripped them all naked and, and perform sexual acts upon them and they were asked to perform acts upon each other as well and they were terrorised at knife point for the next hour and a half to the point when the, uh, the one of the young girls... And this was just random. The, the random. offender was not known to... Not known uh, to them at all. Seen one of the students going in there with the past. And just an opportunistic crime. He just followed yeah. followed these two young girls in and then... The opportunity presented itself, and uh, he said about sexually assaulting, including the male. And he was armed, armed with a knife. Armed with a knife, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then um, one of the poor young girls tried to escape from the situation, and uh, she went out to the balcony, and she clung on, hoping to try and climb into the next balcony. She's naked, fully naked. Yeah. But she lost a grip and fell six floors to her death. Her boyfriend, uh, naked as well, he tried to do the same thing, and he fell as well, but he, uh, he fell and, and broke his legs from the knees down, essentially, and mm. he survived. So here we are. We've got a – we're investigating the death, and we eventually uh, – we interview the other surviving people, and they provide very distinctive descriptions of this man about his certain body parts and certain um, peculiarities about his, about his body, uh, and in particular a tattoo. Mm. A, a tattoo, and I was very again. It's it's a methodical work of the detectives have worked on, and um, a young bloke uh, within the team. Uh, I think it was Lindsay. I think his first name Lindsay Schubert. Yep. Um, he's locked onto the computer and, and tracked this tattoo, the distinctive tattoo, to this man. Right. And that was how we we found him. So when the, when the the victim and uh, her name, I'm not sure, uh, Lao Wei. Yes. Uh, when she she fell and her her boyfriend also fell, did the offender run out from the premises at that time, or did he escape or continue? He, he on? did. Yeah, he just ran out and left yeah. uh, and left them be, behind. And um, and so once we once we identified the tattoo, the manhunt was on, and we eventually arrested you, this. Okay, this, this so part. you got a got a name for him. What what was his story? I, I suppose it's just a sexual predator. Yeah, and and just saw the opportunity to prey upon. These things, such a cowardly and and horrendous, horrendous act upon these these young young girls and men. Mm. And uh, the, the sad part about it was the the young girl that died. She's her, her parents were in in China. How, how old was she? Oh, I can't remember. In, in her teens, in, certainly in her teens. Yeah. But um, she's from one child family, yeah. basically. So mum and dad uh, are living back in China. So yeah. uh, words obviously got back to that we've arrested him. And uh, words got back to the family, so they've they're living in a, in a area, a province, a long way away from the airport. So they've had to catch buses and trains. You can imagine trying to get to the airport now, yeah. eight or nine hours to get to an airport and with, then fly with, with that news. So yeah. basically, they've been flying for the best part of two days into Australia. So they've arrived at Sydney Airport, and I went out there uh, with uh, I was working with Graham Norris, so uh, Chucky and I. Went out and, and arranged for a special room in, in the airport itself. Customs and, and uh, um, the airport security allowed us in this special briefing room. And I went out to to speak to them. And 
the the father was a retired police officer from China, mm. and uh, so we set about and probably for the next two hours, and I had to use an interpreter to explain that the the tragic circumstances of what happened, and I had to go through question by question, waiting for uh, to be interpreted, and then interpreted the answer back. So it was. And were they seeking all the oh, graphic as detail? You can imagine, and, as you imagine, yeah. you don't want to overwhelm them with that. You want to try and tell them what had happened that we've arrested a yeah. vendor. What would you like to know? Yeah. And uh, I said, we went on for two hours and it was so emotional time. And I'll never, ever forget it. Um, after we'd finished talking, uh, the father stood up and clicked his heels together. Mm. And with tears running down his eyes, he saluted me. <laughs> yeah. And I've stood up and returned a, a salute, even though I wasn't in uniform. But um, and so tears are running down my eyes, uh, the respect that he that he had for us. And at that moment, it's, as I said, it was just really, really got to me, and yeah. I just cried. And uh, so we, we, we set about doing the very best we could for them uh, while they were here, um, and it got to the time when they wanted to return home. So I, I arranged through uh, through customs and quarantine to have the little girl's ashes into an urn and able to have her sitting in, on the seat next to her, not putting in the cargo hold. Yeah. She was able to hold onto her ashes of her daughter right. on the plane. So. We actually were able to escort them straight through the uh, through the airport, past all, uh, you know, going through the public area. Yeah. We just escort them directly to the plane. But I thought I might do the right thing on this particular occasion, so I thought I'll pay respect to this man as well. And this time yeah. I, I got dressed in my uniform, yeah, resplendent with all my medals and and, and um, in full uniform. Yeah. So I met him at the airport, and uh, as we we're, we're walking through. And bearing in mind we're being escorted through the airport by all the customs officials, we're getting a, mm. a green light venture. But we get to a certain point when we've had to walk through the security gates. And of course, as I walk through, the machine goes off. Sir, can you come and take your shoes off? So, all right, taking my shoes off. Go through again, beep. Sir, can you start taking your belt and other clothing off? Beep. After the third time, I said, listen, mate. Um, <laughs> You understand what I do for a job, mm. and I'm not getting on the plane, yeah. and I'm not taking any more of my uniform off because I'm covered in metal. Yeah. Clearly, you can see what I do, and thanks for coming. <laughs> and I continued, because all the public are standing there watching yeah. me, you know, undress. Yeah. And I thought, no, this is not the case. Anyway, so we get to the uh, get to the plane, and as they walk up, the th he's turned to me, and I've stood, and I've saluted him. Yeah. And it was a really, really solemn occasion. To do it, but uh, yeah, we eventually convicted. Just a, a little gesture, gesture like that, and it makes so much, so much difference. It, uh, I, I, yeah, little things like that that separates from them just um, making such a difficult situation just that little bit more tolerable. Well, even even uh, I was asked to to sit with the mother at the funeral. They had a hell of funeral yeah. service in in Sydney. Yeah. And uh, I was asked to sit with her, um, and I sat next to her. And there was a time when the tradition was that uh, she walked to the front and stood near the near the where the coffin was, and people would come and pay, walk up and pay their respects individually. Yeah. So you're in a line. Yeah. And as I walked up, it was more effective of bowing yeah. and, and the respect. So I thought I'd had that in mind that she was just going to bow when I mm. came to her. But when I got to her, she just grabbed me and hugged me and hugged me and hugged me. Wouldn't let yeah. go of me. It, and it, it was one of those moments in time that. Um, I had the similar type of situation with um, with Curtis Chang. Yeah. I was um, fortunate or unfortunate to be involved in that that investigation and uh, and given the uh, the task to to break the news to the the family about uh, about Curtis's well, murder. Shall out the front and of the, the same thing. So I, I end up at, at the funeral in St Mary's Cathedral in town in front of fifteen hundred people sitting next to Selena. Uh, and I, I think little experiences like that, because you've been doing it for so long and uh, so have I, and you understand the impact that uh, your role as a homicide detective detective has. Um, murder of Michelle Lang, uh, that was a, a another sad case, a young young lady that was murdered by uh, Derek Barrett. And uh, she was Ch Chinese, studying over here, a Chinese student, and uh, her father had passed away, so she was the only member of the family left because of the one uh, one child policy over there and the mother came over over here and i remember going to the funeral uh michelle's uh, funeral it was yeah obviously extremely sad in the circumstances first person the mother comes up to is to speak to me uh, speak to me and uh, we had an interpreter there and same thing like um cuddle and 
I don't know what it is, but it's just humbling, isn't it, that uh, you've been shown respect from people like that and what you've just described. And uh, I think it sort of brings it home to what homicide is all about. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The yeah. the importance of it. And I think people need to un- understand that. And that's, uh, yeah, anyone working on a homicide, this is what you're dealing with. So it, it's it's not a job, it's, it's your life. Yeah. It, it, you, it's all consuming. Yeah. Uh, and as I said, you, you're switched on all the time for it and to the to the detriment of home because you, your wives and partners make such sacrifices to to make sure that you can do your job. That, that's and for, that's for all exactly the years right. that I was away working on, on jobs, she's my wife's at home looking after kids, doing the stuff, and I'm, I'm off playing homicide detective. Yeah, yeah. You know, thinking you're doing the right thing, you're, you're, you're focused on helping other people out when when the sacrifices have been made at home and, and yeah. you, I don't like saying they would take it for granted but that's kind of the point where it is all consuming it really yeah. is yeah. and and to get like you said to get involved in a case where where the family would would show you this respect and cling on to you because you're the, you're the you're the go-to person for them mm. you're you're there to to give the answers or or um because as I've often said some people the biggest thing in life is a parking ticket and all of a sudden they're now thrust into the spotlight yeah, and who are they going to ask to help? Is you? Yeah, yeah. It it does. It brings it home how important the work that you do as a homicide detective is. With that particular case, it, it, very unusual that um, the circumstances and you managed to get the uh, person convicted. We did, and, and it's an unusual where we we charge him and convict him of murder when in fact he wasn't in the same room at the time. It was mere the fact that that. His actions. His actions caused the person to to try to to escape to, to mm. save their life, and through that, it was the reckless recklessness and the, and the there is a, a causal connection between it yeah, essentially. Yeah. But it's it's a case that he wasn't in the room at the time. He didn't throw her on the balcony, but it was because of trying his to actions. flee the scene because of his actions. They've done it. He was convicted of murder, and I think murder and about twenty two other offences of of inciting. Yeah. Uh, the people to commit sexual acts and sexual assault and multitude of things. I can't remember what what the sentence was, but substantial. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was just such a sad, sad. A sad, to, and for the uh, parents' sake too, thinking that that's what your uh, your child was going through just before she died, the sheer terror of what what was happening. Well, well they're they're overseas, so they they send the child over here to study in yeah. a foreign country, and murdered her here and there over the other part of the world. Yeah. And, and to be told, and they're going to fly into Australia knowing for what's happened to their loved one. And you can Difficult. just imagine what they'd be thinking as they're coming over here and then going back home with, with a room with their ashes in it. It's just heartbreaking. Difficult to even comprehend. Yeah. Um, okay, it's shifting to another, uh, another uh, type of murder. And this was actually, um, you weren't even in homicide on, on uh, this one. This is a murder of Jamie Gow. And uh, you were, weren't you at Robbery Squad at that time? I, I was, that- but. Um, it probably all starts. Let's take us back to 1982. Yeah, uh, in 1982, I'd been trans. I was in uniform. And I'd yep. been transferred from Burwood Police Station, and transferred. Or, or back in those days, um, after you left the academy and confirmed as a constable, um, there were positions where they couldn't fill. So, in other words, they'd either spare people into the prosecutors, or work in the court yeah. staff, or drive prison vans. Yeah. And I, I was driving prison vans and, and trucks and prisoner escorts, and one of the, the jobs that I had there was uh, um, was driving the detectives around of a night shift. They'd have a, a, a special car called a wireless car. So the, the, the police that listen to this the podcast would, yeah. would don't know what I'm talking about. These were called night wireless cars, yeah. and they provided you as a young uniform constable. You'd wear, um, you'd wear plain clothes, and they give you a, a V8 car, fully marked, and you were the driver, and you had the two detectives, uh, and you because you had a, a huge area to cover. Now, I, that's what kind of got me interested in plain clothes as well because I got to work and see some of these good operators. Yeah. Were really, really good. And uh, I managed to get a, a regular run. Every four weeks I did the city one. It's city, so I had um, Central, um, Regent Street, King's Cross, Darlinghurst. Dri- driver for the Driver, and scale. you're working around the, the city, around yeah. Darlinghurst and, and uh, Redfern and, uh, um, and even out to Balmain. So it was a, a big area. And and you just drove. So the point of my story is that uh, working at Darlinghurst one night, 1982, and all of a sudden uh, a couple of detectives walk upstairs, and one of which is uh, is Roger Rogerson. 
So one of the detectives, local detectives, introduced a uh, uh, son. This is Detective Sergeant Roger Rogerson. So he's come over and shaken my hand, and I said, hello, sir, how are you? Because I'd heard of him. Yeah, everyone yeah, had heard, everyone of, him. heard uh, of him. Yeah, everyone heard of him. And all of a sudden, here I am. I wasn't saying I'm in awe, mm. but you're meeting someone that, whose name is whispered around the, around the traps. Yeah. Is, this is a famous detective We're at yeah. the CLB, at the Arnold Holop squad. And I've you know, been involved in a lot of... Uh, a, a lot of big cases at the time and, and a, you know, a fearless type of bloke who would go out there with shotguns and arrest people and whatnot. So here I met the famous Detective Sergeant Roger Rodson. That's 1982. So yeah. now cast your mind to 2014. Uh, I'd left homicide. I had 25 years at the Homicide Squad and I was um, rotated out of homicide and I went to the Robbery and Serious Crime, which is essentially the Armed Holop Squad by a different name. So a whole different type of investigation sphere. Homicides, you're looking at, yeah, obviously murders and, and whatnot. Armed robbery, you looked at the major armed robberies on banks, hotels. You also looked at extortions, kidnapping for ransom. Yeah. Which, and that's, I always found that very daunting coming from an area of homicide where you've got a dead body and you deal with everything there to a point when you're kidnapping pressure. for ransom, you're on the clock. Yeah. You're there to try and find a hostage who's been kidnapped for a major ransom and you're going to find them. Yeah. So it's a different dynamic involved, and like I said, Dif- you're on the clock. Different pressures. And, oh, pressure. Yeah. Pressure. Tell me about it. Um, and all of a sudden, you're expected to be the smartest person in the room, knowing what you're, you're supposed to do. And so I was very, very fortunate that I had some very, very experienced uh, detective sergeants working with me at the time, Benny Whitmore and Jason Ferns. And, and uh, yeah, we had um, – so when when um, I was on call Wednesday night, first night I was on call, and uh, information comes in that a lawyer – a solicitor's gone in to report a, a client missing. It's a little bit unusual yeah. for, a, for a lawyer to come in and report a client missing. And, and then all of a sudden the family's turned up to support the report. And as it turns out, it was Jamie Gale's friends have decided to send the lawyer in because they didn't have the means to, to track down Jamie Gale. So they've yeah. decided to send someone with a bit of importance to try and uh, I suppose get the, get the uh, rather than just a missing person, you've got someone of substance that's prepared to yeah, get people enticed to it. So it's reported to uh, to the police. So there was a suggestion that he'd been kidnapped in in the Padstow area. So as a result, we so rolled the it. solicitor just wandered into the local police station, police station and report, said, and then the family come and provide an information that he it was um, um, potentially been been kidnapped and taken in a, in a had, small white car. At had Padstow. they declared any badness on his no, behalf? No, nothing right. of that. Okay. No, nothing at all. Because coincidentally, as they're reporting her missing. Um, five people were seen skulking in the shadows around uh, Jamie Gow's house in the shadows, right. one of which was seen to run inside the house and then come out, and then they've suddenly disappeared. So what it turned out, it was Jamie Gow's friends that were doing their own investigation, went into his house to see if he was there. Yeah. But it just coincided, and it looked... So that was a line of inquiry you would have had? Yeah, straight then. away, looking at these these potential prowlers, because he's, he's vanished. So I rolled the team out to uh, on call, and we... we Start off at, at Bankstown Police Station and we start to, again, you do your victimology. You work out who is this Jamie Gow. So yeah. you start to delve into his background. And the urgency that was placed on this, uh, well, the solicitor's gone in and reported it, but the suggestion that he might be kidnapped. So that, that was all hands on deck yeah, that, for that, that's right. that situation. So, so you're doing your, your, your victimology. So you're delving into, he's a 20-year-old kid with, I think, he was on remand for a, 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 an offence. But nothing, nothing major, and uh, he's starting to um, to talk to some of his friends, and he's on different social media platforms, so the Facebook and um, and WeChat and a few others that he's doing. So we started to access some of these conversations, and Padstow started to come, yeah, front and center, the area of Padstow. Yeah, but all it was simply was saying that um, I'm, I'm going to be meeting someone in a storage unit at Padstow. Okay, so, so that's what, that's that's what, what started Because that, that, I think it's interesting how this how this evolved, uh, yeah. the investigation. Yeah. And, so then, and then an informant's come forward to another detective and, yeah. and sent him a text message. Um, yesterday afternoon, a kid called Jamie uh, was taken at Padstow. Go and check the CCTV at McDonald's at Padstow. I think he's dead. Right. So, again, Padstow's involved. Now we've got CCTV at McDonald's. So we raced to McDonald's to, see, to check the CCTV. Yeah. It shows cameras down the drive through and in the restaurant itself. There's no kidnapping taking place here. Jamie Gow's not on the vision, but we're in Padstow. So our next port of call is the storage unit. 
So there were four storage units within the area. So we just systematically went through them all and sent a team to each of them. Now, you've got to remember too that Jamie Gow's potentially still alive. Yeah. So again, you've got to overtly walk along the aisles of, of this storage unit to listen into the behind the garage doors in case somebody's kicking and screaming inside the place. So, so did you go in covertly or overtly? We went say? in overtly yeah. on that basis initially yeah. just to check if he wasn't a hold up because it was hundreds and hundreds of yeah. units yeah. and we didn't know if he had the right storage unit. And so then, of course, we went into the office and asked if we could look at their cameras. And uh, so had a team go in to, um, to rent a space. It was the first one we, we did, and we went into rent a space, and they took a laptop in with them, and they were able to access the police computer. So we're looking for a small white car. So they're sitting there watching vision in real time. This is the, the methodical way they work through it, is to watch the vision of all cars coming in, getting rego numbers, doing checks on them. Yeah. So in the meantime, we're, we're following down leads that, so what sort of the time frame are we looking at here? What the, to make oh, from the time it was reported, he was reported to where we're at now. Well, see, we we started. We got called out Wednesday night. The murder happened the day before. Yeah. So yeah. We're, we're behind the eight ball for starters, and we're working our way through it. And it took us a couple of days to get this information. Okay. From these so young you're kids. At, sorry, you're at the storage shed looking through the CCTV three days yeah. or so after. And yeah. and there was, there was a point when. Uh, I was at Bankstown coordinating the job with Aaron Phillips, who, who was the, uh, the detective sergeant, Aaron Phillips, a great investigator, yeah. a very quiet, unassuming man, but don't be fooled by his, his presence. Yeah. A very switched on bloke. He was on my homicide team. Yeah, I, I remember Aaron from, uh, from homicide. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. so AP was, um, was running the job and, at Bankstown. And, uh, and I'll, I'll never forget, I'll get a phone call. They ring, the guys were in they said, Russ, Roger Rogerson's here. I said, what? I said, <laughs> what was going for Roger's here. Roger's here. So when they looked at the camera, they got a picture of Roger Rogerson's car driving in, his station wagon driving yeah. in, and he goes into Unit 803 yeah. and simply takes two chairs out of the Unit 803 and puts it in the back of his car and drives off. That was the day before. Okay. So it, it made no sense, Yeah. but it's something you put in the memory bank. It will, I'll get back to that. It's going to okay. make some sense to you later Okay, on. so at that point, you hadn't jumped to the connection that uh, Roger might be involved in this. You're thinking, oh, no, no. Okay, well, that's just a... Well, in actual fact, we started with Glenn McDonough because when we when we talked to Jamie Gow's mates, yeah. his friends, they started to... It was like drip feeding. They were giving us a bit of information. In the end, they said, listen, he's involved in some drug dealing. Yeah. He's connected with the triads. And he's also connected with a bloke called Glenn McNamara. Right. He's his business card. And those that they've run those, Roger Rogerson, but Glenn McNamara was an ex-cop yeah. as well. So yeah. that was the first thing. So as a Roger wasn't even on the radar. Yeah. But McNamara was. Yeah. So again, I kept saying to the guys all the time, what is the connection between a, a 55-year-old retired detective and a young 20-year-old student? What's going on here? You know, mm. it, it, you keep... When you get stuck at certain periods and you keep asking the question, are we on the right track here? What is the connection? What, what am I missing here? So that, that um, puzzled us for the first time. And the other thing too was whilst we're doing victimology on, on Jamie, we find his car in another area of Padstow. Um, so we, we do everything with the car. We find his phone. We find his wallet. We find all his belongings inside this car. Yeah. So that, that indicates, so that, that's sort of reaffirming to you that something uh, He disappeared. But when, when we do a check of the, of the car number plate and we do a uh, check of all the uh, cameras that he might have gone past and as he's exited the M5 uh, at Fairford Road, that number plate's gone through that on three occasions. Right. But the time limit, time gap is, is some substantial amount of time and we're thinking this has made three trips off the M5. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how is how, this is not making sense? But it will, it will later on. So it's again, you park it to one side. Yep. I'll get back to that. But yeah, you know, there's a significant time when they're at one thirty-five, when in fact it was seen at six forty later on that night. But a big gap in time. It's not making sense. But we'll park it to the side. Yeah. As with the Roger Rodderson sighting, we'll park that to one side because all he was simply there was he was at a unit taking chairs out of a unit. So then uh, our guys continue to watch the footage and hours and hours of footage. And lo and behold, they see the white car come in. Glenn McNamara comes out. He's got sunglasses on and a hood on. And he's got a bit of paper and he punches in the code to get into the front gate. Drives the white station wagon uh, up against the door of Unit 803 that Roger had been to the day before. <laughs> Parked the car and then reversed it until the point when, as you open the back door, it would immediately adjacent to the roller door. 
Right. Now, the other thing, too, with the roller door, every time the roller door was pulled up and down, it set an alarm off that went into and registered on the on the computer. So yeah. every time that door went up and down, it, it, it left an electronic Code. print. Uh, yeah. So we knew exactly to the second when that door was up and down and the movements up and down of that roller door. So, yeah, we focused a lot on, on the unit. But So at, just at, I, I just want to grab you there. So with that information, I'm I'm getting excited looking at it as you as it, you're breaking it down. What were your thoughts then? Was that sort of a gotcha moment, or you're still? Oh no, there's still, plenty. There's plenty of gotcha moments. As I said, processing it, it, it in your in your mind, what the hell is going on? Yeah, here? that's it. And as I eventually I eventually say, it's the six of the most exhilarating days of my life, yeah. where yeah. Um, we just followed follow the clues, and okay. it was just unfolding in front of us. And literally, Jubes, it was just to to see. Yeah, the connection to the unit, so that the guys see the white car pull up. Now, and then they uh, they see McNamara get out of the car, and he walks around, looks around. He's in front of the cameras. Yeah, walks around, looks around, and then calmly opens the back door up and ushers the little kid inside. Yeah, all you see is the white sand shoes. Two steps, he's inside. Oh, right. So okay. So, so what we can see, we can see clearly McNamara, and all yeah. we can see is the white shoes stepping in. So yeah. somewhere down the track, you've got to prove that that's Jamie Gale. Yeah. So two people go in. The roller door comes down, three minutes elapse, and and all of a sudden Roger's car drives in, sneaks around the back, and he gets out and he's got a very distinctive gait as he walks. He walks yeah. through and he walks to the unit three minutes later. Walks in, door goes up, door goes down, and about four or five minutes later he emerges from the from the unit. And uh, that's when he's he's been shot. Right. He's been killed, he'd been executed in the unit. So then Roger goes out brings his car back around and backs it up to Glenn McNamara's car. So now we've got the two station wagons back to back. They've lifted the tailgates up to yep. create some type of, of corridor. Okay, yep. And they just set about walking into the unit with a blanket and then one stage Glenn McNamara comes out with a surfboard bag out of the car, mm. measures it up to see if it fits, walks the surfboard bag in and then the two of them carry the dead body out in the surfboard bag. You talk about excitement, you talk about what was going through your mind at the time when we're sitting watching this, we just couldn't believe it. That whilst we didn't capture the murder itself, yeah. we, we've got them carrying the body out. And, and clearly that, once that door went down for the last time, nobody yeah. has gone in. So in other words, it had to be the, the body of the third they're person. The, they're those great gotcha moments where you you know, okay, the work's not done. You buy, you, you're still a long way short of yeah, making sure this is going to be, uh, be resolved. But that's that gotcha moment where you know, I'm going to get these pricks. Well, well, that's the thing. So we, you know, I've rang our boss, Luke Moore, who's then passed it all up to Nick Caldas and, yeah. and the commissioner about what we've uncovered. Not only have we captured it, we've got Glenn McNamara and Roger Rogerson have just committed a murder. Yeah. So you've got to try and keep a lid on it. And it was very limited, the, the information. Yeah. Stayed very close because we had to call everyone run together and say, right, keep a lid on this. This is a, a moment in time that not everybody's going to get a chance to uh, to uh, to experience. Um, even to the point when we, uh, I was very, very lucky that I went, I had the, the, the robbery squad, the whole team of detectives there who are brilliant investigators in their yeah. own right. You talked before about a special niche of detective that can work on, on different crimes and yeah. uh, not denigrating the other squads. They do remarkable work and some people are so well suited to that type of work. Yes. Uh, armed robbery, uh, the, the young people and, and the older blokes involved in it were, it's just pretty to watch yeah. the way they could click into gear and do things and then f see things on CCTV or race out and, and capture this or capture that or, or interview people and even to track down a phone because we were looking at- they, They've got an operational sharpness, haven't they? Oh, that's right. So we're they, looking uh, at- Part of the thing we did as well with Jamie Gow is we looked at his phone to see what usage it had had. So we'd, we'd worked out that he'd uh, at 11.37 on the Tuesday, he received a phone call that was- listed on the phone as, as from an unknown caller. But we're able to trace it back to a phone box in the mall at Cronulla. Right. So again, park it to one side, it'll make sense later on down the track. So we know that he got a phone call the day before at eleven thirty seven. In the meantime we talked to his girlfriend, uh, a young Japanese girl, and through an interpreter she started to talk about the relationship that had been built by Jamie Gow and Glenn McDamara. They'd been meeting at least 25 times in a certain hotel in Hurstville. And when they would go in, she would hand, she would hold the phones while they met, clandestine meetings. Mm. 
Uh, McNamara would say in court that he was there researching a book and he was using Jamie Gow to research his next best-selling book. Isn't, and correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't he write a book about police corruption? Two, two books, two books, yeah. So, um, it, it, it was a, yeah, a whistleblower. He came through the Royal Commission yeah. and was seen as this whistleblower trying to, to prevent police corruption. But uh, anyway, there's got to have a few a, schools have thought about that. Thick hide there. Yeah, yeah, tell me about it. Um, yeah, so he, uh, as I said, this is all... all Consuming and it's just uh, I'm, I'm getting excited to even talk to you about it. I, I want to break. I want to break out the whiteboard, Russ. <laughs> Let's go. We can catch these people. I'll oh, catch them all right. Anyway, yeah. so so the chase is on. So um, so now we, we've worked out that Jamie Gow was in talking to somebody else. So we traced those calls. Yeah. And we we it took us a couple of days. We identify a couple of triad members from Hong Kong. Now we've determined they've come into Sydney, and as soon as they got there, they've they've picked up five mobile phones in five fictitious names. So they're in, in town. They've obviously brought some drugs in. Yeah. And uh, they've already got five mobile phones. And uh, we're able to trace a phone being used in Chinatown. So we're looking, I'd send a team out to look for two Asian males in Chinatown. Just picture that in your mind. Yeah. Not, not um, an easy Trying assignment. to bounce off calls to see that they're occurring in a certain place, trying to find them. So that was a job in itself, just sending a team out to find two Asian men in Chinatown. Um, in the meantime, um, there's so many things going on that we've we've got to do trying to capture any images of the CCTV around the unit as to how they've left, where they've gone to, and uh, we uh, got to a point where where Luke Moore was was the superintendent in charge. So Luke's going to a, a media release, and he's kindly put the balloon up that we're we're concerned about the disappearance of Jamie Gow. Yeah. We believe he's been killed. We believe he's been involved in a in a drug. Deal. So, so at that stage, um, we're in receipt of some information. The brief, brief is building. Uh, we've got Roger Rogerson and Glenn Mack around the frame for it, but we're trying to yeah. uh, do it because, as I said, all we've got is a is a bloke walking in in a pair of white shoes and him coming out in a body bag. So we've got to prove it's Jamie Gow that's in there. Yep. So we do it by, by preparing a, a timeline using the CCTV and show all their movements for the whole day. And it was remarkable when Aaron Phillips gave evidence in the court. He, he simply was, I think he, he put together a package of about two hours. Yeah. And he just simply played this timeline on CCTV for two hours. And it was so overwhelming. And it was it was brilliant work on his part. To, yeah, he's uh, got that ana- analytical mind oh, that can break as I that, said, break to, that to, down. Yeah, a minute here and a couple of seconds here and a couple of seconds there. Yeah. You sit there and watch it unfold and we can see the actions of, so getting back to that 11.37 phone call. Yeah. Uh, we t- trace back to Glenn McNamara's place and we see him leave his unit. And then the next time we pick him up is in the Cronulla Mall, walking past an ice cream shop, then going into the post office. And then we, we lock into the phone box. So using the, uh, 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 I suppose, what, what's the term that when they use a, a like a toggle, you know, like, like the, the fighter pilots, they use a, a stick. Yeah. And we're able to use that to, to man the CCTV camera around and the footage of it. So we lock in on this phone box, and who should be standing talking on the phone at 11.37? McGlee McNamara. So yeah. every other time he's met with Jamie Gow, he's used his own phone yeah. until the day before the murder, and his last phone call was with him to say basically what we think's happened. He said, right, the job's on tomorrow. Yeah. So they met that night at, at the pub <clears throat> at Hurstville. We've captured all the CCTV and they're leaving. <clears throat> but as I said, where is Roger Rogerson in all of this? At the moment, it's Jamie Gow and Glenn McNamara. Yeah, that's a connection. Roger's on the, Roger's on the outskirts. Uh, we, we we look at phone connection. Now, there's a lot of phone traffic between Roger and, and Glenn McNamara, um, Jamie Gow and Glenn McNamara, but never Roger Rogerson within the same group of three. But looking at phone calls, I think we were able to determine that every time he, he'd have a meeting with him, five minutes before the meeting, McNamara would ring Roger. Okay. That shows and then five that. minutes after the meeting, he'd ring him. So as I said, he's he's on the periphery, and then to, and to see him uh, taking the body away. So we we continue looking at footage, and we we eventually find that now the, the the ownership of the white murder car. So we, we've now got the number plate of the car. Yep. And it was registered to a, a woman in Mount Druitt. Well, what's what's the connection here? So we we send a team out to Mount Druitt and find out it was uh, it was registered to a lady, and uh, it was sold uh, on the side of the road. To a to a uh, a buyer. So now we've we've um, and they they purposely bought the car 
a station wagon to take a body away when you think about it. Yeah, it's because, a lot of premeditation. Yeah, going a lot into of this. people you know, say to us, "Oh, you caught it all on camera. How sloppy were they? You know, they, they, how how stupid were they? They got caught on camera. That's not the case at all. Yeah, this is pure arrogance and brazenness on their part because they methodically planned this out months in advance. That where they they bought a car in a in a bodgy name. Yeah, uh, they they um they used a unit that had no connection to them. You know. Roger was involved in the in the the, the the owner of the unit gave him six keys, and he handed five back, uh, so he kept one key that yeah. they used to get into the unit. Um, anyway, so the, the white car never appeared anywhere for a month, and what had happened? It, it had been purposely outside of camera shot. It was McNamara had, had, had used it, and he lived in, a, in an apartment complex in Cronulla. Yeah, but downstairs parking, he had his own car there with cameras everywhere. But he couldn't secrete the white car downstairs, so he, he thought he could park it around the building, and it, it stayed out of camera shot until it got a parking ticket one day. Right. And all of a sudden, a, a parking officer there to give him a ticket and takes a photograph of the car. So now we've got the car in his possession. Yeah. Um, a couple of days before the murder, so now we've got ownership of the car with Glenn McNamara. As you said, the brief is is building. So again, we watch, we look at CCTV footage, and you see. Um, after the murder, they're bundled into the white car. It goes down the driveway downstairs. Now, I'll come to I'll come back to the boat later on. Anyway, so we see the white car, and then at some stage, the car drives out with both of them, and they end up at at a, a Kennard's storage, self storage, and they went to hire a, a block and tackle because the, now they've got to put a body in a boat. Yeah. Now the the boat. Um, come to our attention. We, we knew nothing about the boat. It was when Glenn McDonough was arrested and we're looking for the surfboard because we've got the surfboard bag around the body. Yeah. So we're looking for the surfboard and, and we've got information to suggest that the, the surfboard was on on my dad's boat. Mm. Your dad's got a boat, has he? Where is it? And, and mentioning you know, a storage unit. So we went and found the boat, spoke to the people there and they said, no, the boat's been here all the time. We said, can we check your cameras? Sure enough, the day before, <laughs> McNamara's come in, taken the boat out, drives into a service station to put some oil in it, engages the the, uh, the lady at the cash register with conversation Yeah, because we look at the CT to capture it and he's pointing out to his boat and he's wearing the clothing he wore at the time of the murder, mind you, <laughs> and he's pointing out to the boat, telling her about, that's my boat out there, yeah. I need some oil for my boat out there. Um, and he's kept the receipt for the purchase of the yeah. oil. Not only did he keep that receipt, when we, when we arrested him and did a search warrant on his house, Literally in a shoebox, we find the receipt for the purchase of the car. What's he going to claim it on tax? Well, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, I'm that's a what professional I thought. Killer. So we've we've kept the he's kept the receipt for the purchase of the car, which is in in a false name. Yeah. Not only did that, but it later produced the fingerprint of Roger Rogerson was on the receipt of that car. So that ties Roger in now to the yep. car. His fingerprints. How did he try to explain that? He said that when he was in the car with. With Glenn, he, he thought it was an old taxi, and he looked in the in the glove compartment and and pulled out the receipt, and yeah. was just a bit of a nosy person and put it back in. Like uh, someone like Roger, he could throw up a lot of uh, lame excuses, and on its own, that might wash. But when it's all building up the way this is building up, the brief against them, yeah. it's, uh, those those excuses starting to sound a little bit shallow. Well, that's right. So then, so we move on from the fact now we've got the the white car, we've got ownership of the car, now we've got all the receipts. So we take the other receipts out for the spin to see what what they bought with their with their money. So we end up in a uh, in a big W store. Um, I think it was out at Miranda. Two days after the murder, we have got Glenn Mac- McNamara walking into Big W, and he spends ten dollars, and we knew it because we had the receipt. Yeah. So we bought the same items ourselves. So what did we buy for ten dollars? We bought a plastic spoon, uh, a plastic measuring cup, and two brown pillowcases. So just remember that. Mm-hmm. So we look at all the other receipts, and one of the receipts was was at Kennard Self Storage, where they've hired the block and tackle. Yep. So we go and we look at the camera vision of that, and it shows um, Glenn McDermott and Roger Rogerson walking in. Uh, Roger would later claim in evidence that he, he was crippled, he couldn't lift his arms above his shoulders, but here he is clearly talking to the manager. Yeah. Uh, we need something to do this, and he's lifting his arms up above his shoulders, saying we need something to help carry something. What they were indicating was that there was a dead body. It was in a boat that was on a set of on a trailer that was in a garage downstairs at McNamara's place, and they couldn't get the body in there because you've got a man who's uh, uh, 
in his 70s, yeah. somewhat crippled, yep. and you've got McNamara. How are you going to get the body of Jamie Gow in the boat? So yeah. that's when they've gone to the self-storage. But he kept the receipt for the purchase of, of the block and tackle. Now, not only that, um, the manager has written down the number plate of, of the murder car, which is parked outside. Yeah. So now we've got um, Glenn McNamara paying for it and his credit card signing for it, and the manager has written down the car number of the murder car, which is parked out, yeah. outside there. Why was the manager, why did he write? Well, that's what we're just trying to work out, whether he's suspicious or whether it was just protocol. But normally yeah. when you hire that, you don't normally take down a regular number of a car. No, I, I prob- uh, possibly it was. More just, than likely, yeah. he may have recognised the two of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, or one of them. Yeah. But anyway, so uh, so he's kept that receipt in the shoebox. So again, it was just, uh, yeah, people say, oh, well, the brief was presented to you. No, it's not the case. Well, I think you're giving us a, a really good... Um, uh, demonstration of the type of work that goes into solving these murders. Like it's, yeah, you don't just start off with, oh, there they are on uh, CCTV. That's the end of it. We're taking, you, we're charging you now. Oh, and taking uh, you, to court. you don't come in and just press a button and sit back and watch a TV screen. No, there's there's it's, so much work. That the goes work into that it. the guys put into it was was remarkable, and to sit there and watch hours of footage, literally hundreds of hours of footage, and you develop, and to the point where the evidence we uncovered was so overwhelming, overwhelming. Uh, that you know, we predicted when they got to court they would have to give evidence because they, they could remain mute at, at a trial and yeah. say nothing. But this case was so over, they had to get and explain their actions. Yeah. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm kind of lost where we're at, what stage we're up here. So we've got the, You've got take the, the car down, and now they've, they've gone downstairs, and we've got footage from inside the lift yep. of them going downstairs, and then they've wrapped the body up, and then they've walked back upstairs with a carton of beer, and they've just set about having a beer to each other. Right. Uh, and then the next morning, uh, the next morning, we look at footage uh, going down the lift, and here's Glenn McNamara uh, walking down with a bag, and inside the bag, a, a plastic shopping bag, you could see through it, and you could see the orange T-shirt that he wore at the time of the murder. Yeah. And there was something else in the bag. It could have been the gun. We don't know. We never recovered the yeah. gun. But the, he uh, he then got into his boat and drove the boat up the ramp and to take it away. Now, we've got footage of the boat coming into the into the unit. Yeah. And as you look at it, there's nothing in the boat. It's, it's, there's nothing in the boat. Yeah. So he drives his car down. But when it comes out the next day, the following morning, um, it's got, here's the body wrapped up in a, in a blue tarp, clearly displayed in the boat. So if, uh, they've come, they've parked the boat on the top of the ramp and he thought, well, I'm going out fishing. I better take some, some props. I better take some fishing rods with me. Yeah. So he goes downstairs to get some fishing rods. And who should emerge but a fishing buddy, but Roger Rogerson walks out of the unit and walks up and they hop in the, the car and boat and drive off. Yeah. And that's when they've taken the body out to sea. So we don't know where it was dumped, but um, it got to the point when when the bloom was up and we, we had footage of, of the murder. And getting back to Luke Moore's media release, yeah. it prompted people to ring it, ring us in. So during the uh, the the... I suppose, the door knock that we did, and there was a number of business premises there that we needed to get in. And because it was a weekend, we didn't have access to to get to their cameras. And one bloke in particular rang us up and he said, um, uh, you better come and have a chat with me. I've got it all on camera. He said, what are you talking about? He said, I've got it all. I've captured it. I've got, got the cars. And this is the, the vision of the meeting where Jamie Gow's walking down the road yeah. to, to get into the white car and Roger Rogerson's car's behind him. And he said, oh, I've told Channel 9, Channel 10, and Channel 7. Oh, no. And he's given them the footage. So I thought, oh, shit. So we've had to rush out and speak with him. Yeah. And have a look at the image of what it was. It was It was the, the last little piece in the puzzle, basically. It, it fitted in well. Yeah. But they were about to go to where. We hadn't arrested on that stage, and it was about to go to where that night. So uh, at a very high level. Um, Called in some favours. Yeah. Um, basically, a... Uh, uh, talked to the executive producers of the networks and yeah. they made some type of embargo that, look, you can't afford to put this there tonight, yeah. but stay tuned, stay tuned, yeah. things are going to happen. And to to the point when they, they did, but the ball escalated where, where it had come to a point where we had to quickly develop arrest plans. So we arrest uh, McNamara. At that stage, Roger had left the state and he was up in Brisbane. Right. So... A team goes out to arrest uh, Mac- Aaron Phillips and Mick Banfield, arrest um, uh, McNamara, yeah. um, and bring him back to the station, interview him, and charge him first. So simultaneously, I go and execute a search warrant with Mick Shuhey, 
and a team, we go out and execute a search warrant at Roger's house at Patchdar. Now, he's not there, but I speak to his wife and uh, say hello to introduce myself and tell her what we're there for. And um, so she tries to ring him on the phone and his phone's switched off, but we know it's bouncing off Redcliffe. Yeah. So we know it, he's, he's got it. He's up in Redcliffe, exactly. Queensland. And then he rings us while we're executing the search warrant. And we're finding in amongst there, we find his clothing he's wore on the camera. Yeah. And what they did the day after the murder, they, they returned back to the murder scene. Roger's got a, a mop and bucket, a distinctive That's green right. bucket. And they go back and they're washing up the crime scene yeah. the next day. So we find the bucket in his house. We find all the clothing. We find the baseball cap he's wearing. And when we when we test the baseball cap, it's got gunshot residue on the baseball cap. Yeah. So he's washed some of his clothing, but hasn't washed his baseball cap. Yeah. And it's got gunshot residue on the cap and also gunshot residue on his tracksuit pants. Yeah. So as he's, as he's obviously walked into the unit, at some stage, you know, he's, we think he's had the gun. Yeah. And, and you no, know, we never determined who the shooter was. I'll leave it up to you to think who, who we think it might have been. But um, for for a legal point, when we get to trial, um, because of this is what they call a, a colloquially a felony murder. Yeah. Where and just to explain that. Yeah. So basically, that- a, a felony murder is it's like akin to say three men go to rob a bank, two men rush into the bank, and during the exchange they they shoot and kill the teller. The third man sitting outside in the car. As a getaway car gets charged with murder as well, even though he didn't do the shooting or was involved, the offences they they involved themselves in carried at least twenty five years or more. And someone's died as someone's died as a result. Yeah. So on this occasion, we've got murder that carries life. Yeah. And the other one was the commercial supply of the drugs. Now I haven't touched on the drugs yet, have I? No. So they're involved in a commercial supply of drugs which carries life. Yeah. So when we get to court, and and, and Chris Maxwell was the crown that uh, prosecuted. This was what they call a joint criminal enterprise or we, what we term as a felony murder, we don't have to prove who the shooter was. Yeah. Both of them were there. They're both equally as guilty as what they've done. Anyway, so getting back to the point, we we find we were trying to locate where Glenn McNamara was living. Uh, again, his phone was indicating he's in the Cronulla area. Uh, we know he went to the phone box around the corner from him, but we didn't have, really have his new address. Uh, he was living in another place before. Yeah. So uh, our guys have gone into the general area and we've got some information to suggest we found the unit he's in. So it's the early hours of the morning, so they've managed to go downstairs and we found his car downstairs, that his, his own yeah. car. So they rang me and said, Russ, we've, we've got it. We've got his car. So we look towards doing some things with, with the car and, um, and trying to monitor his movements and, and conversations and whatnot. And uh, so as they're about to leave, they're walking out of the unit, and as they walk past the visitor's car park, here's the white murder car parked in the visitor's parking spot. Beautiful. So they rung me about 2 o'clock in the morning. They said, Russ, we've got it. We've got the car. Jesus Christ. So what do you do? You can't leave the car there. No. It's evidence. The body's been in there. So it, uh, firstly, I said, check, there's no body in there. Yeah. And once they satisfied themselves the body was in there, we've got to take the car. We can't leave it there. Yeah. So we sneak the car out under cover of darkness. Again, at that stage, the brief is building. Yeah. Um, it's all coming together. And all the bits of pieces. See, all the information doesn't come in a chronological order. No. They come in bits and pieces. You've got to put the puzzle together. Yeah. So at that stage, we've now got the murder car inside the visitor's car park of the, of the complex in Cronulla. So we had to get a tow truck in. Now, bearing in mind, Glenn McNamara is asleep upstairs. And it's now getting towards daylight. Um, so we've had to hurriedly get that car out of the early hours of the morning with a tow truck very quietly and we sneak the car away and we take it into Surrey Hills to uh, to the crime scene section. So they're doing a, a, a search through the car and behind the back seat they find a green backpack. So they've taken the green backpack out and inside the green backpack is a brown pillowcase. Now remember I said yeah, the, yeah, and the two inside spoons. the brown pillowcase yeah. is three kilos of ice. Right. This is what this is all about. Okay. We've got three kilos of ice. Uh, purity was 80%. Yeah. It was real, really high grade stuff. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm no expert on, on drugs, but I think potentially they're saying at least 250,000 a, a kilo. So yeah. you're looking at, as it was, about seven, about three minutes. But yeah. when you could cut it down, it was potentially anywhere between eight or $18 million, the yeah. value of the drug. So this is the this was the prize. That's what it was about. So what they did, they they've murdered this bloke, and then gone upstairs, celebrated with a few beers, left the car downstairs with the drugs in it. Yeah. 
Um, the body's been taken out to sea, out to Cronulla, and things are going sweet. Like they haven't haven't um, brought any attention to themselves. Yep. So getting back to the footage in the storage unit, after a certain period of time, it reignites itself. So all of a sudden that tape was going to tape over itself. Yeah. So you get back to the point of what I say about the, the methodical work that the guys did and, and the, the brilliant work they did to actually seize that and to, to respond to it straight away and capture it. Because had they not done it, they lose it. Our starting point would have been the body when it washed up at Cronulla. Yeah. Now even when that washed up, I'm at the airport with uh, with Mick Sheehy. The um, Luke says you better get up to Brisbane. So you had that phone call, the uh, conversation when you were at uh, Roger Rogers Rogers house. Yeah, place. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So and, and what what the what did he say to you? We said to us, he, he said to Mick, um, he said, uh, "What are you guys up to?" And Mick says, "Oh, we're here to execute a warrant." He said, "Have you found what you're looking for?" And Mick said, uh, yeah, we have, and we need to talk to you. Now, this was a Saturday night, I think, and I think he said, uh, I'll come back and I'll, I'll see you. And we knew at that stage he was booked on a flight coming back. I think it was the Monday, mm. Monday morning. So we now moved into the early hours of Sunday, and we thought, uh, he said, yeah, I'll, I'll come and see you. I'm flying back on Monday. I'll see you when I get back. And we think, nah, yeah. sorry, nah. So um, we then uh, get told, go home and pack a shirt. So yep. we've again we haven't slept for days. So we go home, get ourselves a shirt, back at the airport, waiting for the, the airport to open. And every flight that come in from Brisbane, we're waiting at the gate. Yeah. And no Roger Rodderson. So yep. we thought, okay, he's and they say, uh, Russ and Mick, hop on a plane, fly to Brisbane. So we've went out and booked ourselves a ticket. Now yep. the journalists journalists are right, they're following us around. Yeah. So as we've gone to book a ticket, they've gone to book a ticket. So we're sitting on the plane with all the journalists. So we've had to have a, a quick meeting with them and say, right, these are the ground rules. If you're coming with us, you stay out of our way. And if we get to the point when he's coming back, there are no interviews. Yeah. Uh, you are just basically sitting away from us. You'll have nothing to do with us. Yeah. But but while we're booking our ticket, I, I get a uh, an SMS and up pops a picture of the body floating, the blue tarp floating in, in Cronulla. And a question, is this Jamie Gow? I looked around the airport and here's the journal sending it to me. It's on Facebook now. So the body of Jamie Gow... Potentially, is, is now hit Facebook. Yeah, yeah, and it's 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 out there. Yeah, and of course, I we knew nothing about it. We didn't know it was Jamie Gow from the first place, but yeah, you know, potentially it was him. And what had happened is they weighed the body down, but a chain had broke as the body's yeah. gone down. The chain is broken, the body's popped up. So that was I think on the Friday. So I said, I'll take it back to the point. Had we not got that vision at at Redis space. You, Our lost. starting point would have been Jamie Gow's body floating up on the Friday. Yeah. So you could see how you could quickly lose five days of evidence. Anyway, so we, uh, Mick and I fly up to Brisbane, and uh, as we've got out of land, where cameras were everywhere, it was like the Kardashians had landed in town. And uh, we're trying well, to feel Mick out. Too good. Oh, I mean. yeah. It's a mix of big blood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We stood out. Um, anyway, so we worked with the uh, the Queensland Homicide Squad, a bit of a manhunt trying to find Roger. So yeah. we, we tracked his last movements, and unbeknown to us, he was he had the, the uh, at least twelve hours on us. Yeah, and once he'd seen the, the vision of McNamara being arrested, yeah, he said, and you were looking for him, to looking arrest. for him. There yeah, was not, yeah. Not, yeah. Not, Look, the manhunt yeah. was on, so we're up in Brisbane. So yeah. he manages to get himself a car. He drove through the night back to Sydney. Yeah. So Mick and I uh, pack up stumps and said, right, we'll, we'll go back to Sydney as well. So we. We get a phone call from his lawyer yep. to say that um, he's going to bring present him to the, the Sydney Police Centre. Uh, we said, well, we fly in at about 11.30. We'll yep. see you at the Sydney Police Centre at a certain time. Um, but unbeknownst, so we got on the plane, turned our phones off. Yeah. So there's a lot of negotiating going on um, in amongst the lawyer and, and uh, he's doing interviews with Ray Hadley and yeah. and all other stuff. So unbeknown to us, certain demands was, was a, he wanted – Roger Rogerson escorted in a green light escort into into town, like yeah. fate. This guy is some type of yeah. hero, and and Luke Moore said, "Nah, no, nah, mate, yeah. nah, we're going out. And we're going to lock him up." Yeah. So our guys have gone out on national television, arrested yeah. him, and you, you, you I remember everyone it. remember yeah. seeing it. Yeah. So Roger's arrested on on national TV live. Yeah. Take him back to the police station. So Mick and I have flown in. We've come to Bankstown and we walked downstairs to the charge room. And, and I go back to my earlier conversation when I met Roger Rogerson in 1982. Yeah. So I walked up. He's sitting in the dock and I walked over and he said, uh, Hi, Ross. How you going, mate? And I said, Hello, Mr. Rogerson. How are you? He said, um, I said, mate, how do you know me? I said, look, I've, I met you in 1982 yeah. as a young constable. He said, oh, I don't remember that. 
He said, but I know who you are. I know all about you. I've followed some of your cases and I know what, what you're in. He said, I'm not going to say anything about this brief. And I said, uh, it doesn't matter, Roger, you're fucked. He, good on we you. We got you. Yeah, yeah. We got you. Yeah. Because he's still trying to take control there. And that, that's yeah. what you see, Gary. He, he's a type of bloke that had this charismatic personality. And you yeah. can see over the years that uh, he was he was trained to be a a tremendous witness in the witness box, giving evidence. Yeah. And, and it just his mere presence yeah. would, would command respect and, and that you would hang on every word. And you could just imagine him giving evidence in, yeah. in murder trials and jury be sitting there listening to this bloke. Speaking with authority. Yeah. But, yeah. And here he is doing the same with me, yeah. sitting in the dock. Uh, waxing lyrical about old cases that he worked on and tried to engage me in, in a yeah. conversations. And I'd actually looked at a couple of cases that he worked on. He worked at the Special Crime Squad, which yeah. is the, the pre-runner to the Homicide Squad back in the day. So, yeah, I just started to talk to him about a couple of old cases yeah. that I'd, I'd worked on. And he remembered them and, and wanted to engage you in conversation. Yeah. But at the same time, you're thinking, yeah, he, he, the mind trying. games are starting. Yeah. And and that's what I thought, that's what I thought he, he thought he would... He would have his day in court. When he would get in court, he'd get a chance to get in the witness box and back to the days where he could yeah, win, the jury smooch, win the jury over. Yeah. Uh, but on this occasion, uh, the, the Crown was too smart. Yeah. Um, the other barrister, there was, see, it was a cutthroat defence because they both blamed each other. Yeah. When I got to court, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, they were cross examined by respective barristers and then the Crown stepped in and smashed them up as well. Yeah. And of course, the judge. Um, Justice Bellew ran a very, really yeah, well, he, hard he, trial yeah. and he was on the ball and um, and actually questioned Roger himself in the witness box and picked him up and, and yeah. when he was getting off track, he'd focus He, he would have been up to the And challenge. in the end, he was flustered. Yeah. Flustered. And even to the point we're watching the the, uh, the body language, he sat in, in court as a uh, as a crippled old man with a head, set of headphones on. Yeah. It was like, like a scene out of The Judgment of Nuremberg. <laughs> Yeah. Remember Burt Lancaster in, in that film when he's sitting in, in there with the headphones, headphones. on as, they, as the, uh, the the Nazi war crimes are, are yeah. unfolding? He just pictured me the fact of an old man that's sitting there that's got to have a headphone on to interpret what's yeah. going on. And that's how he kind of wanted to be yeah. seen. He was still playing the game. Playing the he? game, and as yeah. I said, they, but as I said, the, the, but the jury was out for six days. Yeah. It took a long time, and, and we were a bit worried that, um, that it was that little three minutes of, of time elapsed. Yeah. That that was his well, out. If they, that if was they, his that, out. That cut throat defence. If they just cause confusion within the jury, like it was him, it was him, and that mm. gets that division of, um, amongst the jurors. And uh, so, so that's the thing. The crown has to prove everything. We yeah. have to convince twelve jurors. Yeah. The defence have to produ- have to convince one. That's all they need to do. Exactly. Is yeah. convince one to create as a reasonable doubt. Yeah. Yeah. They've got everything to gain. We've got everything to lose. It's a, it's a hard, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard getting that beyond reasonable doubt, and, and uh, getting everyone agreed. And on. even to the point when when the trial started, because it was going to go for more than three months. Yeah, they actually impanelled fifteen jurors. Yeah. So even to impanel a jury took all day. Yeah. To to go through it, and then they had fifteen jurors sat in for the, basically the whole of the case. Yeah. And it was at a point when they were about to go and deliberate the verdict, the judge was going to step in and say. They're going to have a ballot, basically, yeah. and I'm going to call your name out or call your number out, and you're off. You're off. Yeah. <laughs> but but it got to the point when, as we're getting towards the end, uh, we lost three people on the way so, uh, through illness or through other excuses, yeah. and we end up having the 12. Yeah. But they were still there for six days. Yeah. Often wonder what they're deliberating about. Yeah. But uh, anyway, we'll never know. But they come back with, with guilty, and, and Justice Burley sentenced him to life without parole. Yeah. And he said it was the most heinous crime basically yeah. seen, and it was a, a murder for profit. Yeah. Where, whereas, in fact, what, what they've essentially done is, is McNamara has, has groomed Jamie Gow and saw the opportunity. How, how they met, how they met was a two of Jamie Gow's mates were arrested and they were on remand at a jail. Yeah. Their lawyer has come in to, to represent them yeah. and needed an interpreter, so he's brought Jamie Gow in as an interpreter. Yeah. But he's also engaged Glenn McNamara yeah. as a private investigator to come in and, and have a look at the brief right. from a police perspective to see what what uh, holes he could well, find in the brief. And and that's how McNamara and Jamie Gow met. you gotta, you got to feel sorry for um, Jamie Gower too. Like, yeah, he's been yeah tied up with drug uh, or uh, it looks like drugs, but still. Uh, 
Well, well f- funny you say that because I, I copped a bit of shit over that. Yeah. Um, because after they were sentenced and I've got up and, and spoke about yeah. about that and praised the police for a remarkable job they did, I yeah. said, let's not lose focus with, with Jamie Gow here. Yeah. I said, uh, you can lose sight of what this is all about. This become the, the Roger Rogers and Glenn McNamara show. I, I remember there was some pushback yeah, on you, because wasn't it? And people saying, well, you're defending a drug dealer. Yeah. Well, hang on. I, I don't pick and choose my murder victims. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. They're all equal to me. Yeah. There's somebody's son. There's somebody's daughter. Our job is to go out and, and solve this and and to to do the right thing, yeah. regardless of who your victims are. Yeah. It, it doesn't mean anything to me. So, so for me to get up and say, we've lost focus on this, that this is a story about a young kid, yeah. an impressionable young kid. Yes, he was dealing in drugs. Yeah. He was a naive young kid. He was groomed by, by this bloke, and he was simply dragged into this thing, unit, thinking he was going to make some money out of a drug yeah. deal and simply executed, yeah. boldly executed uh, by these two men who never brought money to the drug dealer. It was simply just walking in, always gonna be. bang, bang, shot him dead, yep. two two taps to the chest as he's sitting in a chair. Yeah. Um, and then they uh, simply, the plan was to, the, the money, the drugs was in the car. Um, we knew that the next stage was going to be a tow truck was going to come and take that car away and take it to a holding yard somewhere. Yep. And then somebody was going to walk into that holding yard, pick the drugs out of the backseat of the car, take them off to be distributed. The car was going to be destroyed. And they were the good way of it. So this is the plan I talk about, the meticulous planning yeah. that went into this. This is simply not a, a matter of Keystone Cops were were caught on the camera. How stupid were they? Yeah. That's not the case at all. And I, I remind you, it's it's brazen arrogance on their part yeah. that they did everything very methodically. And if they didn't have any hiccups along the way, what they didn't count on was that we – get involved and we're a little bit smarter. Yeah. So I got to the point where we start off with a little bit of information and all of a sudden we start to control it and all of a sudden we're a step ahead of them. Yeah. And we're able to, to devise plans to arrest them and, and the brief just built in front of us and it was just, as I said, remarkable, remarkable work on a big team. It was it was great and uh, to have that opportunity to, um, yeah, Roger Rogerson and uh, Bring him down because he re- it reflects badly on all of us. The, the cops, the good cops, where some someone like that and the way he's conducted himself. So full credit to you. And I think you said to the team uh, that the uh, at the time of the arrest that this is something that you're going to remember for your whole of your career. I'm glad you said that because uh, that's one thing I did say um, after we'd like I said six of the most exhilarating days of my life. We had little sleep and we just kept rolling along and yeah. it just get more exciting as you went on. Bits of evidence were being uncovered and all of a sudden. We arrest and we we have a debrief uh, back at the local pub, yeah. and everybody's around and we're we're just so excited. And what you got to imagine is you and I started at the homicide squad as young detectives, yeah. impressionable young detectives, and all of a sudden you looked up to the the sergeants and the inspectors. Yep. And now I'm one of them. Yeah. So now I'm here. I I'm now talking to to the young team, and I got up and I individually thanked them, shook all their hands, yeah. and hugged uh, everybody, and went around around the room. And I made what I thought was somewhat of an inspiring speech yeah, to, yeah. to the people. I said, remember this moment, folks. Remember this moment because not everybody gets a chance to feel what we're feeling now. Because yeah. it's a strange sensation. And you mentioned it before about excitement and that when you're working on a homicide investigation, you don't want to be shown to be be uh, thrilled about what you're doing. It's, it's yeah. a unique type of, of work you do. Yeah. And it's a unique type of, of experience that you have. Like the elation when you get someone that confesses to you. Yeah. Or you you catch them out on in a lie, or or you finally, yeah, you know, you're in a manhunt and you find this bloke hiding somewhere, and and the exhilaration is something that everybody gets a chance to experience. Yeah. And you think in in your whole life, you could work through your whole career. Yeah. But to say that you were part of the the team that arrested Roger Rogerson and Glenn McNamara. You tell your grandkids about that. that that's right. That, that, and that's that, what I said. I said, you're making history tonight. Savour the moment because not everybody gets a chance to do what we and did. And we remember back as when we were young homicide detectives. If the boss was saying stuff like that, that resonates with you. You hang on to the words that uh, yeah. people people say and, uh, yeah, it, it means something. But uh, your career, Russ, I, I've got to um, – well, I'm not going to take you to part five. That would be just taking <laughs> – I might stop I Catch Killers to I Catch Russell Oxford <laughs> and we'll just sit here and talk forever. Um, amazing career, amazing stories, and, and your passion comes across uh, when you, you're telling the stories and you live it and breathe it. And to me, that typifies what a good homicide detective is. 
what would you summing up? What would you say makes a good homicide detective, or what are the traits that you need to be a good homicide detective? Oh, I think you've got to be prepared to go, um, yeah, work long hours, make sacrifices, um, work within a team. Um, as I said, you're not the smartest person in the room. You've got to take on board what people say to you. Um, as I said, it's just methodically working through your work and above all, remaining very humble yep. about what you do. It's such a tremendous responsibility that with that's thrust upon you to do. Like every every type of death you investigate, it ends up either in a coroner's court or in a Supreme Court. It's a case that you just can't put into a file and then put it away. These things live with you for the rest of your life. Trust me, they do. Yeah. They, and you know it. Yeah. Uh, so all of a sudden, you're given this tremendous responsibility. So you've got to remain humble because, as I say, the, the job's not about you. It's about your victims and, and you're there to uh, to do your, your best. And so, again, to me, remaining very humble about what we do mm. is, is top of the list for me. Uh, and then a matter of, of, of compassion, empathy, um, and just a, the methodical approach. And, and every now and again, you, you you talk to your people and, and review what you've got. What have, we, what, what have we got here? We're missing something. Go back to your crime scene and see what we're missing here and continually talk to it, to your team. And But it's simply just a case of just looking for dedicated Disciplined people, yeah, uh, of a like mind, yeah, and, and then and when, if you're an opportunity to run the jobs where you, you, I'm providing encouragement along the way, and and that's what you need. You, you need when you're putting in hard yards, and the people are down. You need someone to stand there and say you're doing a good job. You know, you're doing a great job, even to try and inspire your people to go out and do a door knock because yeah. it's a mundane type of job, but it's it's a crucial part. So you, you normally give a briefing to the team before they go out there, ladies and gents. You've been called in to do this job. Um, you're going to knock on a few doors, but what you could understand that you may hold the key to this job. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Don't and, don't and just dismiss people or just tick off a sheet and say, "Did you see anything suspicious?" No, 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 no. Ask them where you're here. And what on did those, you see? What did on you those hear? tough jobs, every day you've got to think you're going to get that breakthrough, yeah. and you just got to keep going and going. And yeah, nine times out of ten, you will get that. Yeah. Uh, that uh, at the breakthrough. same time, you you you're looking to adapt to te technology. You're looking to adapt it the way. So I, I cut my teeth. Is that uh, why they got rid of us, Russ? <laughs> <laughs> look, as I said, look, I, I only learned off people before me. Yeah. And, and and there's a ne next generation of homicide detectives that take over from us. So you want to leave, you want to leave things in a good place. Yeah. So if there's an opportunity to to um, work with with your team, and then they take it on the next job they work on, and all of a sudden it's it's you pick up traits of people you work with. Yeah. Good and bad, but yep. you identify and you and you want to make yourself in the detective that you, you'd hope you would be. You take bits and bits, bits and, and pieces, pieces from everybody, yeah. and and as you said, you continue to learn. Continue, as I said, don't think that you you know everything. Yeah, because clearly you don't. And you make mistakes along the way. You learn from them. Yeah, but it's more the fact uh, to me. It's in a position I'm in now is to try and provide that encouragement, provide the spark to keep people going along the way, and encourage people. Yeah. And that's that's what it's all about. Is there's nothing better to hear from your boss to say. You're doing good. You're yes. doing good. We're going to get this somewhere with this, and you're all going to be part of it. Yeah. Uh, and as I said, if, if you work on some of these cases that go for months or years, yeah. Um, yeah, the rewards are there. The rewards are there. You just you've got to pay the price to. Yeah. Uh, to but to at the same the time, you, you, some of the jobs end in frustration and, and sadness where yeah. you can't solve it, and you. Yeah. And you, you, but you, uh, you can take solace from the fact that uh, you and your team have done everything that can be done, and I. I Always uh, believe that's uh, yeah. You can sign off on that if you've taken it as far as you you possibly uh, possibly can. Um, other than that, not much. Oh, not much more to discuss. We could just go on and on. It was uh, funny uh, that people might be aware of the demise of my career, and uh, I was put in a room and uh, was referred to. I think at police headquarters, the naughty boys room, where, which was like a fish tank of humiliation, a caged lion. I sat there for three months and uh, I, <laughs> I just think we should explain here that uh, when I left uh, the police, I passed the baton on to you and you got placed in the Naughty Boys uh, room and uh, how long did you last there for? Um, yeah, you got to set the scene. Uh, it was a stage when I uh, I moved on from armed robbery and I went to the child abuse squad. Yep. Again, that's a whole new era of of, of sadness and dedication and, and remarkable detectives that yeah. work there. So you, you see another side to, to policing and, and so I could talk about child abuse matters and the horrendous nature there. Yeah. That's a whole different a whole different, whole different game. Yeah. Um 
Yeah, and no, I'd moved from there, and I, I came back to work in the administration area uh, within within state crime. It probably coincided with with Heather, my wife Heather, had died at that stage, so I'm, yeah. I'm coming back in, into work, and I wasn't in a good frame of mind, and clearly I wasn't coping. I wasn't coping, and uh, so I was in a, like an administrative area, and I was given a a job at like a special project to do, and and the only seat they could find was in this little office, which is in the, the Gary Gary Jubilant Departure Lounge. <laughs> so I lasted six hours. Yeah, you had three months, I had six hours. <laughs> Whoa! And then the job was called off, and then um, not long after that, I was at a conversation, and um, and I made a decision to retire. Yeah. Well, Russ, in terms of retiring, you should be very proud of what you what you've achieved, and uh, yeah, you've left a legacy, and uh, but people can't ask for anything more than that. And uh, you've managed to do all this and still be one of the world's nicest uh, people. And uh, probably the worst I've heard you say when you were cranky, and you know, I used to uh, laugh at you with uh, Pam Young. Would be we'd be comparing you and Jaco, and the crankiest I heard you say was, "Golly, geez." And that meant Russell was really pissed off and really, really cranky. But uh, you're an absolute legend in my mind. I looked up to you in my career. And uh, thanks so much for coming on iCatch Killers. Thanks, Gary. I appreciate it. Cheers.